gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's a great pleasure to, uh, to, to represent President Bachelet. I, I'm going to speak of uh, some of the different things that I, that I, you know, how we integrate air quality and climate change policy and how we shouldn't take the same road that some countries took and learned along the way that were wrong in terms of uh, having divergent policies. Today, we see with great um, clarity that air quality issues are the biggest environmental threat today, accounting for large amounts of the uh, health effects of and, and, you know, lung cancer, heart disease. And when I go to the OECD and they present the different studies on the health effects of pollution and the GDP loss due to climate change, for many years these were divergent. The, 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 the same study groups were, were, you know, one study would start, this next study would start, there would be no linkage. But we've seen through the work uh, of, you know, R Ramanathan and, and Shindel and the work uh, politically through the Climate and Clean Air Coalition uh, that we can have an opportunity to integrate these both, uh, both policies in which we would have an easier road to two degrees with the 0 0.6 degrees we could achieve in cooling due to black carbon, methane, and HFC reduction. I'm going to go through these fast. Obviously, we see the air pollution is very big. Uh, in Chile, we've accounted for the, air, for the water pollution uh, effects. So today, our biggest threat actually is air pollution. And in the, in the right panel, you can see uh, a city of Timunco uh, with and without restrictions to the wood burning use in bad air days. So the, the, the difference is quite big. We set out to do a, a big, ambitious uh, target to reduce 80%, 87% of the risk associated to air pollution uh, in, in the very short term. We saw that this was something that the people thought, saw as a threat. 33% uh, of Chileans thought that air pollution is a threat, but also waste is an issue. Uh, even dogs, stray dogs, have uh, uh, come up as a, as a sort of a air pollution, uh, pollution type of a, uh, environmental challenge. We've done a lot in Santiago, as you can see, uh, in which we've reduced the annual concentrations from 69 micrograms per cubic meter to 20 micrograms per cubic meter, which is a 72% reduction in 27 years. And we've done this in multiple ways, uh, banning wood burning, uh, old wood burning stoves and increasing um, restrictions on diesel emissions while we clean up the, the, um, the different sulfur, uh, sulfur sources. But, and we had actually almost gotten to zero uh, PM10 uh, episodes, 97% reduction. But this is not really focusing on the, on the PM2.5, and we need to go further. We recently had a, uh, had a, um, a report with, uh, with EPA in which we looked at what would have happened if we had no measures, and we had just continued with business as usual. And we could see, actually, that our reduction of premature mortality would be well, what we've done up to now, based on the, on the uh, business as usual, is a 10,000 uh, premature mortality uh, reduction per year, which is quite dramatic. Well, we had done a lot of things in, in Chile and in Santiago, but we had forgotten the south of Chile. Uh, the people of south of Chile would always come up uh, to, to study and, and smell like they had uh, smoke. And, you know, something was going on and we hadn't really measured it. And we started measuring air pollution and we started seeing that actually Santiago was by far actually not the, the dirtiest city, but there are many that were much worse. And in 2014, we decided that we wouldn't want to look at this and not act, but actually take measures right away. The important thing here is that the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Health was our key ally. The Ministry of uh, Environment has to go, undergo a very long process to approve pollution control goals, but the Ministry of Health has immediate, uh, drastic, draconian uh, measures, and, and so we were able to take measures right away. We, saw, we said that we didn't want any more smoke in 2014, and we started taking measures against uh, wood burning smoke air pollution. We started doing uh, 14 new pollution attainment plans, which is seven times uh, more than usually is done in four years. And we uh, adopted the PM 2.5 standard, with that, which actually, if, if you look at it, in, in, it, 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 it visualizes a lot of uh, issues that were actually ignored. And we take the threshold to half of the, toleration, the, to, the, the tolerance that we would have for other episodes. Other things that we did is the pollution, uh, the 
power plant emission standard, which is very uh, important. It was very controversial at the moment. For We do this for existing and new power plants, and we're actually adopting the EU standard. The thing is, uh, these you know, we, we had a big dramatic change in the control of power plants, and this was very important. And as you can see from the image, um, and this has brought down um, emergency room visits due to respiratory crisis dramatically in, since 2013. We're talking around almost 80% reduction of uh, respiratory crisis uh, in four years, which I think is very uh, important. In all these cities which we took these measures, in which the largest source is the power plant. But also, we started looking in, at what happened in the reduction of, of the same indicator in other cities in which we took measures, because again, we adopted measures uh, from Santiago to Coyhaique. The Coyhaique is the most polluted city in South America, in Latin America, as the WHO report showed. But the measures that we've done have reduced uh, these same crises substantially, as you can see. And overall, the reduction is in terms of 38%, while the places we haven't taken measures have increased the, 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 this, these crises in, in 13%, which is a 51% difference in four years. And so the, the, the main newspaper in Chile went out to not look at what we're, we're doing and say we're doing a great job, but we sh they actually found this out. We, we, didn't, we hadn't found the right indicator to show the big decrease. So in the places that we've actually taken measures, the health effects have dropped in half. And we did this, and here's the science side of it. I, came from, I come from the University of Iowa. I got my PhD with Professor Carmichael, and we always had this dream of uh, taking measures before the pollution episodes occurred. And we developed a national forecasting system that we have deployed that with, the, say, with, the, with the premise that if you take measures from day to day, you're not gonna prevent the event because uh, there's accumulation of multiple bad air days. So therefore we need to start taking measures two to three days before. And we started adopting this and we started um, working with the previous government uh, to try to deploy this forecasting system to build the credibility for this model, which is a dynamic model uh, that goes from Santiago to Osorno, basically based on population density. We also look at the increased wood burning emissions based on predicted outdoor uh, temperature and many other uh, aspects. And this has really uh, done a great job in, in Santiago particularly. We, I think we really got the handle of how to reduce episodes. Uh, the pre-emergency and emergency episodes have been reduced by 94% since 2014. Uh, nationally, reductions are episodes between 40% to 70%, but you can see that the premature mortality estimations that we've prevented is around 1,300 cases, and the emergency room visits are in the ballpark of what I had just said about the, the crises, around 40,000, which is sort of the, the similar to the number I, I said that are, has been observed in reductions of the emergency room visits due to obstructive crisis. In this context, we have to design a new pollution attainment program, which we called Santiago Respira. Santiago Respira is related to the Breathe Life campaign. Many other cities have joined this campaign. Uh, the WHO and the UN Environment have led. Uh, we have, this is what the new measures uh, consider. First off, I think the diesel emission scandal is probably the biggest em uh, environmental fraud that we've seen. And we knew this. Uh, we didn't know it was fraudulent in nature. We knew that th there's a departure between emissions from uh, diesel vehicles with, uh, with respect to the theory. We first off started with a green tax on new cars based on NOx emissions and CO2 emissions, so therefore we wouldn't have uh, diesels be benefited from this. This has led to a 30% reduction of NOx emissions for the fleet in 2016, and we'll see how it goes with 2017. We measured uh, 190,000 cars in Santiago, and we de developed an emissions inventory based on observations and the departure from the lab, or, um, or uh, basically the standard, and we decided, and you can see the difference is quite big between the, you know, the observed and versus the, the theoretical value. And so we designed, designed a, a vehicular restriction um, so we, you can't drive your car every day, right? And we exempt the clean cars, we have a, and we have a two, 
two twenty percent uh, re vehicular restriction permanent for the winter time, and exempting the cleanest cars, which are Euro four and Euro and Euro five and Euro six, and so therefore this is going to be starting this next winter in Santiago. This uh, theoretically will increase the overhaul of the fleet, uh, and this has already done before when we did this uh, in 1991, in which we exempted cars with catalytic converters. Uh, these cars are old, have high emissions, and so this, ex this is, I think, the cheapest way to overhaul a fleet of cars uh, without subsidies, which would be regressive in nature. We've also had a long-standing um, advance in reducing the emissions of the Transantiago, our public uh, system for transportation. Um, but the new step is going to have uh, Euro 6 buses and around 90 uh, electric buses in the new contracts. We are also, and I think this is very important, banning wood-burning stoves from Santiago altogether. This will prevent 718 cases of premature mortality per year. And it has a cost-benefit ratio, including the increased uh, cost of fuel, 115 to 1. And this is what the result will be uh, in the future. We'll reduce residential emissions 93%, uh, transportation se uh, sector 65%, and industrial emissions, which are pretty clean, in around 19%. There's also uh, measures against uh, confined um, animal feeding operations in which we'll uh, reduce the ammonia emissions because I think it's also a very cost-effective way to reduce uh, ammonium nitrate in Santiago. The overall plan, uh, will reduce 2,200 more cases of premature mortality and has a cost-benefit ratio of 8 to 1, uh, in which you could see the transportation sector, the way that we designed it, will be uh, cleaning up the transportation without very big cost. Also, this, uh, this whole story was murked was the, uh, by the fact that we had very bad air days due to soccer. Chile didn't make it to the deep part of the cups so we didn't have people celebrating, but this the 2016 and 2015, we were very deep, and that's a very mad moment to have barbecues. As you can see, we reach daily or uh, hourly concentrations of 600 micrograms per cubic meter uh, across the whole city, and you can see that where the, the game time started one hour after this peak uh, occurred. This is very unpopular to discuss with the people. Uh, because they, they don't think, uh, you know, they think we're trying to blame other sources, but the organic carbon uh, contribution spiked to 90% in those days. And you can see this is something, at least we won this cultural fight, uh, around 60% of Chileans acknowledge that barbecues are uh, a contributing factor to pollution sometimes. It, this doesn't hurt Kirker every day, but when everybody wants to have the game and party at once, it really makes a big impact on the air pollution, which goes to show that solid fuels and biomass burning are largely the culprits of increased pollution. But, there's a, but once we started learning uh, about pollution and how to cost it out and the externalities, we decided and we said, well, why don't we add the value of pollution to the uh, sources, the large sources also of uh, the power sector? And this green tax that we introduced that's in effect starting this year uh, has sent very powerful market signals, but also is Im based on the CO2 emissions, which is obvious, but NOx emissions too, SOx emissions and particulate matter emissions, and based on population density and the pollution attainment status. Therefore, a clean location pays a lower tax than a polluted location, and thus uh, sends a very strong signal on uh, land use uh, for where to place uh, largely polluting locations. And the other thing is that the incremental abatement cost is much cheaper than the tax. So therefore, we are seeing power companies overperform the tax, so the, if, uh, the, sorry, the emission standard. If the emission standard is 50, you'll see like the power, uh, the, the power plant that I showed you is emitting five, is 90% lower than the standard that they said was impossible to meet. So therefore, uh, economic incentives are very important for this too. But we have to see what this uh, black carbon does to our greenhouse gas emissions. That we have to link air pollution and climate mitigation. We have done an initial estimation with Tammy Bond's group in which we have looked uh, that we have around 50% increased black carbon emissions, uh, warming, warming uh, equivalent, 
due to these emissions, and these emissions are largely due to biomass burning and diesel exhaust. So we have to be looking, and obviously we, there, there's an issue with the organic carbon and seeing what it does with the balance. But overall, what we're seeing is that, I don't know what, yeah, there you go, that we'll, we'll get around a 57% more uh, greenhouse gas emission mitigation if you include the black carbon decrease uh, due to the, the mitigation from the pollution attainment pl plans and the emission standards that we're bringing online. Also, so once we set up a level playing field in which we have a tax, we have an emission standard that has increased capital cost in power plant emissions. Uh, we are in, in, in energy auctions that have been unbundled in which we allow renewable energy to be uh, auctioned at the, at the time that they produce. We have brought down energy costs. Uh, 2017, we have the, the value, the overall value, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what the average value today, it was just today's news, is $32, which is 75% cheaper than what we did in 2013 with 100% renewable energy, solar PV. The, other prob the problem we have here is that solar PV is so cheap that the concentrated solar power, which is uh, auctioned at $48, it actually doesn't win the, the auction. So we need to find ways in which the solar <coughs> PV doesn't cannibalize uh, uh, base load e energy. Uh, uh, otherwise, you know, it's a shame that you know, $48 per, per megawatt hours of CSP is not awarded because it's very clean, very cheap energy altogether. So um, last year we sold that, uh, we, the, the energy auction was actually $29, so the cheapest solar for this auction was $21, but since the United Arab Emirates is going to $17, Despite we have lowering our cheapest solar PV by 30%, it's not the world record anymore. But this has unleashed around uh, $3 billion more increased investments in renewable energy. And the emissions intensity of the awarded ener energy is substantially lower than what we had in 2013 with very dirty uh, fuels. So we've ha had increased um, uh, renewable energy, five-fold increase in three years, and 190-fold increase in uh, solar energy overall. Now, the energy companies have said they will not pursue new coal-fired power plants, and I think that's going on everywhere, um, n not by mandate, but by market. Uh, and the big thing they, they say here, the, the Gener people, who are big players of coal, they're saying, you know, this carbon tax, you know, it's not big anymore. It's like a little, little uh, pebble, but the catapult is already built, and you could put a, a big boulder in there, and it's going to you know, it's going to bring down uh, uh, coal. So they know that they don't want to be playing this uh, game anymore and they're not doing any coal-fired power plants anymore. Our renewable energy potential is huge. As you can see, it's uh, around 2 million megawatts, solar PV, wind and solar, mostly solar PV. And I think overall we're going to have to be looking at ways to export it because we're not going to be able to use that much energy because our total capacity today is 32,000 megawatts much lower than the two million megawatts uh, that we have solar PV uh, potential. Uh, another thing that I think is important to talk about is the conservation. While world, some world leaders are looking into, you know, uh, put, taking out coal and gas and oil in natural parks, national parks, one thing we're doing with the Tompkins Conservation, Patagonia, uh, the company, is to have eight new uh, national parks with nine million acres. It, the ocean conservation is important. We have a large responsibility, and we've increased uh, ocean conservation to 46% of our economic exclusive zone with some lands in, in, in the Cape Horn and Juan Fernandez and Easter Island. And uh, the thing that we thought was important to bring light to our ocean conservation is to also be uh, having the first, Ameri the first uh, bag of plastic bags in coastal communities uh, because of this plastic issue that we saw is important. Uh, I think, well, it's good when we get outside support. Not, not a lot of people know what we're doing today in Chile. We have a very difficult time to produce and, and, and do outreach on this, and people think that actually things are far worse when doing far better than we thought. And President Bachelet, of course, is at the core of this. Uh, as she says, you know, Chile needs uh, to have, you know, uh, we need to development that goes with the environment. Uh, and that's what people want. And that's my, comp my, my commitment for the future. I think overall, what we've shown is that we could have increased growth at lower energy cost and lower emissions. And that's the false paradox that we are not, uh, the, first, the false dilemma that we're not falling under. Thank you very much.